I think anyone developing something, we have to kind of understand why I, am I even doing it. I mean, all those have been established since, since late 1890s by Dr. Eng, Edward Engel. And then after that, there's a settling group and there's all kinds of this famous organist. And we have a very set on theory and practice. And yet, I start to question a lot, <laughs> okay? So let me go to the next page. So I really start to feel that whenever I deal with some cases and the way we analyze, I feel like we're looking at the flat word. It's, it's a really one-dimensional analysis. So one information doesn't really give me any dimensional uh, explanation. So for example, we're basically using Basically, we're very relying on self-analysis and then the arch analysis. So let's just go to, okay. This is what I taught, that we, in, in order to define what's normal of the patient, we actually connect the interproximal most reasonable line and then we call it normal. So then my question always is that as much as we can normal, then somebody really has to justify the canine is not in the right place. But we really do not have any way of justifying even this as a right format. Only because they're touching each other doesn't mean that this is patient's normal, right? And then at the same time, we had so many various, this normal, like a countless normal arch form. So if there's something, is not right, right? And then now let's go. Focusing on this molar and the incisor, we're only picking these two teeth to archive this whole entire information, okay? And then the bigger problem is those two teeth information doesn't really give anything about the arch morphology. So even though I spent three years in my ortho residency tracing to death, right, I didn't really got not much out of it. And it doesn't really change my, my practice. Like, okay, the teeth are flared, the molar is in class two. So what? <laughs> it really not changing the way I'm gonna treat the patient. So in terms of analysis, analysis, it really has to give us predictional information, how I'm gonna treat and diagnosis. But the current cephalometric analysis doesn't give us none of the information. It's just sort of saying that, okay, teeth are flared. Okay, it's flared by a certain angulation. Okay, so let's talk about the, what really dental metrics is. Okay, it's actually morphometric analysis of a dental arch. Okay, the morphometric uh, is it really studying some objects by its surrounding structure. And it's most commonly used method of understanding any kind of biological form in medicine. So look at the dental arch. It's completely disassociated from your face. So dental metric really has to start to understand this arch form in relation to all this surrounding structure. And then physiologically, we have to start to understand how it gets affected by all this surrounding soft tissue or muscle, okay? The next thing is the clinical arch, now we have to look at it as a developmental deformation, unless there was a malformation, which is more of a congenital. So most of the dental metric is what we're talking about when everything is given by nature as, as a normal structure, normal jaw relationship, normal teeth morphology, Okay, when you look at the clinical arch form with a lot of crowding, it's no longer it's about teeth. Teeth has no problem. <laughs> they have a correct morphology, right? And when those teeth cannot put it into your arch form, it's not really teeth that's too big. It's deformation of the mid face that pushes the teeth around it. I didn't really go over into all the anatomic uh, configuration underneath the teeth and all that because we only have very short time today, but that's something that we have to start to look into it. So the problem that I see is what's happening currently. So on the, under the benefit of improving the airway, now we are starting to splitting a palate. 
So that means instead of looking at the morphology, which is a shape that correlates, the, correlates with the size, we are only looking at, at the size problem. So when somebody comes with a constriction, we think, oh, your jaw is too small. So now we are even aggressively putting these pads, okay? And now we are splitting the palate. So now knowing that the roof of the oral cavity, which is the palate, shares the exactly same anatomical uh, composition with the nasal floor, okay? When we do this, we are splitting the not on the palate apart, but we are splitting the nether floor. Okay, so this was the initial constriction, and this is within four or five months progress. So look at how much we changed. Okay, and one of the things that she was really um, surprised was that there was no really opening in the middle of the palate. There's a more like an even distribution. But whenever you see that mode of even distribution, that means the teeth are flared a little bit out. So the activation should be actually stopped before we start to see the uh, space. See, all your teeth and shape and size are there for a reason, to fit within the skull, right? So, so now the treatment. We are so much focused on the feeding, okay? So when you look at the case, we already defined, okay, this class one to three. Right, but those teeth were shifted that position so that they can function. But we don't. We totally skip looking at the shape. So the biggest question is, what is the shape and size of the arch that will allow us to fit teeth into class one? Because we already all built to be that way. The uh, the configuration of the SLDA. It's some, a lot of people ask me what is the difference between, you know, quadrahelix or portal arch. The mechanics is very different. So that's another <laughs> session to talk about it. So this was done by one of the residents, Dr. Lillian Heights. And this is how initially we studied the case. Uh, there was a lot of debate how we're going to treat this case. I said no extraction within six months. So. This is a, after, from here to here, there's a reshaping process. So the patient actually has SLDA underneath. And um, this is a, a five months, so this is how she looks, okay? So obviously we will start using some elastics to start to fit. So the first, we reshape and start to align. And the SLDA does a lot of realigning already. And then start using the elastic fit. And then by 11 months, she's done. I mean, it's a school, so it takes a little bit longer to finish the case. But by five months, I, the point was that she was almost ready. Okay. So now let's talk about the canine impaction. So there's a lot of debate about the canine impaction. What do we do? We should be able to guide it. So this is also secondary function of our arch deformation that blocks the teeth. So because the canine is one of the teeth that develops kind of later among the anterior and posterior dentition, and if they are start to developing above the oral cavity, they obviously going to take us longer time to come down. And then when your arch form is like that, everything gets pushed in. So by on deforming the arch, now the canine can start to come down. So this case was done without any extraction, I mean, any exposure. We just guide the canine. I think I posted some of these cases um, in my, you know, Facebook or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So the reshaping process, okay, this patient also was recommended for surgery and extraction and all that. And I said, no, I see enough plenty of space by looking at the arch deformation. So I was able to finish her by reshaping it and the aligning and start to fitting. And we sometimes have to let the patient know that we really cannot close that space because that crown was made when the arch was deformed. So don't even bother to close that one because that's actually the short crown height, okay? So this is what it is. This is how a patient came in. So currently we think that this is a patient's normal form. No, that's not. According to her airway dimension, according to what the, two, the dimension of the teeth are dictating, that's how everything should be aligned. And that's exactly what I did. So let's look at the case. 
the patient was actually traveling from China and uh, Taiwan, so the, ch the, ch the child only had uh, two months to, to be treated. <laughs> so this is how we started, and it, this was about seven weeks, slightly less than eight weeks progress. So that's how we left U.S. And then this is how the, the orthodontist in uh, Taiwan, they finished, and th that's eight-year retention. So let's let's just I'm gonna show you some full case. Okay. This is this case was also done by the one of the residents at Harvard, uh, Dr. Oscar. And and when the patient came in like this, everybody's saying like, Oh my god, this is really, really hard case. How are you gonna finish that? Should we pull the front teeth and what's going on? And I said, Well, let's really figure out what is really wrong with him. So actually look at this arch, uh, how his arch should be. His molar segment was perfect. Actually, in fact, there was a flare out, so we had to bring it in. And basically, this tooth was in a better position. So we're going to start to move everything back into where they're supposed to be. And even then, like a patient had a lot of some of the perio issues. So once the teeth goes into the better place, even the perio CEJ seems to be a little bit, tissue start to remodel where they're supposed to be. So this is the SLDA we start, start to putting in, okay. And then this is when I actually removed it once the arches start looking much better. Okay. And then once I moved into a little bit thicker wire, then I removed the device out. And by then the patient looks pretty good. And then this is how I finished. So was total, was it seven months? I, I forgot, <laughs> but it was less than a year. That's my point. <laughs> so from here, day one, four months, and then seven months. Yeah. So I think it's really critical to really understand when the patient comes in, we have to really start to think that that's a deformation. Just like when patient comes in as overweight, you want to say they want to make all the normal based on your weight. So I think what's missing in orthodontics is that we really have to start to define some type of index that will tell us the relationship between the two sides and the airway. And we have it. So hopefully we get to start to apply in the clinic. Because I see too many strips and I see too many stripping and I see too many splitting the palate. And if you can do the cases very minimally invasive, Okay, somehow I feel like orthodontics is going more towards maximally invasive, okay, all the tat and all this. But if you actually look at the, the patient's mouth, almost looking at the landscape, there's a lot of crookedness. But as soon as we see that and we start to thinking we're going to undeform it according to their anatomy position. Mm -hmm.